pleasure to start this special session on Code to Europe conference, which is about the future of Europe and also the big opportunity for us to launch a new book, which is exactly the book on our European future. Uh, all of us, we have been through difficult times. Uh, unprecedented crisis, COVID, with such a huge social economic impact, still unfolding. At the same time, we were building our strengths to cope with this crisis and we come up uh, with important decisions uh, in the global front and in the European front. And we are now, right now, completing the design of a large recovery plan, which should also be an opportunity for us to transform our economies and our societies, coping with the new challenges, notably the demographic transition, the green transition, and the digital transition. This is also a, a moment for a big creation, imagining what uh, we want for our lives and for our planet. But uh, at the same time, we must be able to think on the long term. We must be able to imagine our future uh, for humankind, for the planet, and for the European project with uh, a bold project and a bold ambition. That's why um, Europeans, while they were dealing with this COVID crisis, while they were planning the green and digital transition, they also start a conference on the future of Europe. And uh, we know it was not easy. It was not an easy birth for this conference. But here we are. The conference is now uh, really starting uh, content work. And I'm so pleased that um, FAPS was invited to prepare some content quite well in advance. And that's why we're able at the very beginning of the conference to come already with a very substantial outcome, uh, which was prepared by a FAPS expert group. Uh, this expert group is quite unique, I can tell you, because we could put together uh, many of the brilliant minds we have in Europe and beyond uh, to think about the next phase of the European project. And uh, the book is not, uh, let's say, a blueprint. No, this is an inspirational book with uh, many ideas, with a progressive mindset. Uh, and this is just a start for a longer term work we want to undertake. Uh, we believe that we are really entering in a new phase of the European project. In the new phase uh, where we need to be precise on what is the main problem we need to cope with to reinvent the European project for the planet we have, for the challenges we have in front of us. And we believe that the central problem is the, is the following. We are at the beginning of a deep transformation with ecological transition, green transition, with a next phase of the digital revolution, which should transform all sectors, all markets, and our way of life. And we believe that uh, Europe cannot this, do this alone. Europe needs to work with the, its international partners. International cooperation is the, a crucial principle 
of the European way to live in the planet. And uh, we need to have an external action of the European Union, which at the same time creates the room of maneuver, the strategic autonomy, but also resets uh, an engagement with the multilateral system and the need to renew it. But then we have uh, the big question. If we have this level of ambition, renew our development model, renew our external action, where are the means for this? And this is the, the final part of the equation. We need to be much bolder when it comes economic governance, financial means, taxation system, and last but not least, our democracy. We believe that European democracy needs to go to a bold transformation. The next phase of democracy is uh, something crucial to make all these other ambitions viable. We understand that this phase of the European project can only have success if we can count on a big push by citizens, not only by European institutions, um, by the main actors we know about in European politics, we really need to engage citizens at large. And this is, in fact, in a nutshell, uh, we believe the central equation of the European project for the next phase. So it is my pleasure today to launch the book. Uh, very soon you can have access to this book with one click. Uh, but uh, I'm really, uh, really very grateful that I could put together some of these experts and authors uh, who will illustrate the kind of debates we had ourselves when we were preparing this book. And uh, let me conclude by saying this kind of debate is part of a much larger debate of an intellectual movement, a cultural movement, a political movement, uh, which is taking place now and which we believe will be much larger underpinning the ambition of this conference on the future of Europe. So let me start uh, by introducing uh, Carlota Perez. Carlota, many, many thanks. You are a leading figure of um, a recent, a new uh, school of thought in economic science, really needed, uh, going to the roots of evolution, evolutionary economics and um, innovation as a key word. And uh, this school of thought was able to highlight what should be the role of state to cope with this new situation, particularly when we need to uh, combine green and digital transition. Uh, you are coming um, from uh, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose in UK. And this is my pleasure to give you uh, the floor for first introduction. Thank you, Maria. It's been a pleasure working for this book. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is the moment. What I have been saying is that we are at the precise instance historically when it's necessary to reinvent the state. Every golden age si since capitalism began has been actually led by a reinvented state. So it so happens not only that the state has been reinvented, but it's, it's a particular moment at which it happens. And this, we're actually late. It should have happened after the crash of 2008 because that's the equivalent, more or less, historically, of what the crash of 29 was, and then you had the recession, and then we had the golden age. And the same thing happened uh, in, previous, in previous golden ages. The Victorian boom also began after the crashes of the 1940s and the, and the Belle Epoque after the crashes of the 1890s. So actually, every technological revolution has two periods. The first period is inequality, creative destruction, 
very messy period. And the second one is the golden age. And that's when the state comes back in, reinvents itself, reinvents, redirects technology. Because the reason why it can happen at this moment is precisely because we now know what the technology can do, the good and the bad. So we can now shape it. So because we didn't do it at the end of the recession in the uh, in 2008, we can now do it with the reconstruction. In fact, what happened with the COVID pandemic is that we rediscovered the role of the state and that will make it much easier to come back. The thing is that the reinvention of the state has to be a positive sum game, a win-win game between business and society. So we've had to change the whole thing. So I have put a lot of emphasis on the need to change it so that we can get rid of populism. And why do we say that we get rid of populism when the state reinvents itself and reshapes and gives direction to the technology more or less at this time in the process of, of diffusion of this revolution. It's precisely because what happens in the first half of this revolution is that uh, inequality, destruction of skills, destruction of jobs, industries, regions, that is very typical. It happened in the 1920s also, and it happened each time in the past, this, this period of destruction. So we now have to reconstruct. And as we reconstruct, we take away the resentment, we take away all the inequality that resulted precisely from the, in this case, we actually had three. We had first the globalization, destruction of jobs, well, destruction in one place and creation in the other, which is one of the major things that technological revolutions do. So, but as far as Europe is concerned, we actually had the exit of the jobs going to Asia and other countries. So the reason why we need to, to come back and to reinvent the state and to have new ways of creating employment, new directions, new uh, ways of getting to the new stage. And that, in this case, I say is about is five things. It's green, it's fair, it's smart, it's global, and it's gross. Mm -hmm. It's smart because it's about the digital revolution. It's uh, green because, of course, we need sustainability, environmental sustainability. It's fair because it has to be socially sustainable too. We're going to reverse the, in, the inequality that we have created. It has to be global for something that might seem strange. It's global because every one of these reshapings that the state has done with each revolution has actually uh, found a way of creating new demand. The post-war golden age raised the salaries of the blue collar workers until they were able to buy houses, cars, and everything that goes into the house and everything that could be produced with the mass production. Now we have to create demand again. And I think that the best way to create demand is, is to get the developing world to develop. And why is that? Because the demand for Europe, I mean, the demand for the traditionally advanced world, because mass production, the production of goods has gone to China in order to create in Europe the, the new demand. We need to get the developing world, all of it to develop. Then we have demand for capital goods. We have demand for uh, engineering, for projects, for education, for all the things that Europe could actually uh, create. And at the same time, if Europe becomes the sustainable place where we have a rental economy instead of a mass production waste uh, planned obsolescence thing where we can have goods that last a hundred years, maybe they're made in China, but we can maintain them 
with enormous amounts of employment and various other things that we all know we have to do. But we have to avoid one very important thing. We've got to avoid the green revolution being another wave of destruction of skills and jobs. It will have to be, but it can be later. We can design a route to, to the green transformation that will guarantee that we start with the job creating things and then we go gradually so that we recover. We can transform our cities, what I just mentioned about the rental economy, many other things within the green transformation. We've got to think what's the best route. We've got to design a route that will allow the, uh, the job creating things to happen first. So we recover all the people who have been pushed out of the workplace. I know that many people say we have uh, full employment. It's not true. We have precarious employment. That's not full employment. We need proper jobs. We need good jobs. And that means a true transformation. So why Europe? because on the one hand, Europe has the most advanced world welfare state. It had the most advanced welfare state. We've got to not only reconstruct it, but to make it better and to make it appropriate to, to the new conditions. It also has tradition of working with the developing world, probably because of colonial times, of course. So it can also be refigured relatively easily. High proportion of the population is in environmentally conscious and that makes it easier to go green faster and another very important thing which is the last thing i will say is that europe is one of the few places in the world where we really have a multi-level state we have the supranational we have the national we have the regional the local the municipal and that is the way that we've got to reconstruct the reinvent the state we have to reinvent a multi-level state for the whole world we need global institutions europe can be the model for what we can do but for that europe has to make itself into the model and then help transform the world uh many many thanks uh carlotta you are really a brilliant uh intellectual uh, able to bring together all these pieces uh, I will come back to the issues you just raised, uh, but one of them was that if we Europeans, we want to uh, move ahead with our new deal, uh, we also need a kind of a global new deal. And this brings me to the next speaker, who is an outstanding uh, intellectual author working with issues of a um, political economy, but I would say a global political economy, Paolo Guerriere, uh, coming from um, the Sciences Po, but also working with the California Business School. Paolo Guerriere, uh, what can you tell us about the new way of Europe to act in the global sphere. Yes, thank you, Maria. Uh, you know, first we we should say that, as uh, as you said, the, the the world economy has been has been profoundly changing before the, the pandemic and is going to change even more. You know, in this post-COVID scenario due to the decline of the old multilateral order. And at the same time, you know, the, the, the pandemic has shown how important are so many public goods for the world economy, you know, in terms of, uh, of course, vaccination, the climate change, financial stability. So we are in a phase, an historical phase, uh, that where the global economic governance has never been so needed and at the same time is also never been so difficult you know to uh, uh, build up and it's very clear that the, the rebuilding of the global economic governance is a is a, is a vital for the uh, european and the eu interest and so you know is 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 crucial that in a, in the in the near future 
the EU should strengthen its international presence in the world and achieve this, uh, you know, open uh, strategic autonomy in this new global context. Now, in the book that you uh, uh, mentioned, we indicate that, you know, four priorities for the future, you know, in order to increase and uh, reinvigorate this presence of Europe. The first relate to the uh, relation with the, with, with the US, United States and China. Uh, uh, Europe uh, re suffering, you know, great damage for this uh, uh, fight and conflict between the US and China and has every interest in, in, in avoiding any degeneration of this fight. So what is required is first the more effective management of our relation with the United States and, and certainly the Biden presidency does offer Europe a new opportunity to relaunch transatlantic relation on many fronts, trade, technology, environment. But Europe certainly should ex exploit this opportunity, but maintaining its own identity, you know, uh, uh, profile. In this regard, there is no contradiction between the relaunch of the transatlantic alliance on one hand and greater strategic autonomy of Europe on the other. Furthermore, we need to coordinate with the, with the US to negotiate with China, because in order to achieve greater reciprocity at the bilateral level, but at the same time, you know, to cooperate globally with China for common public goods. And of course, climate change, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the first priority. But here too, you know, uh, uh, Europe should have its own China policy and maintain its relative autonomy. Since we share, you know, many concern of the United States in terms of uh, security threats, in terms of human rights, but of, uh, for example, economic integration with China, with Asia Pacific, this very important dynamic area, the European goals and interests are not identical, you know, with, uh, with, to those of the United States. So this is why it's important, you know, this kind of uh, uh, coordination with the US and our own autonomy and strategic autonomy. The second priority, uh, uh, Europe should take the lead to the preservation of global public good. And first of all, you know, climate change and environment is uh, indeed extremely important. And the EU is already on the forefront of this kind of, uh, of uh, of, of battle. Now, is a global alliance will prove difficult, you know, uh, in, in, uh, to achieve any time soon. I think the EU should favor a kind of climate coalition between a group of countries in order to, you know, open the way to a future kind of uh, a, a, a multilateral deal. The third priority is that you should defend is uh, and consolidated this very complex and sophisticated network of bilateral and regional trade and investment agreement with many countries in the world, you know, in Asia, in Africa, in America Latina, because this is a complementary and not an obstacle to multilateral approach. And this trading agreement is bilateral and plurilateral should also need to promote, you know, environmental and social standard in uh, in uh, 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 in partner countries to achieve fair trade and not, you know, simply free trade. The fourth priority is the international role of euro of the European currency. It's very clear that the direction is a multipolar monetary regime in the future because the uh, Chinese uh, currency, the renminbi, is going to be and is going to have an international role. And it's also very clear that the euro should be part of this new regime. So it's time to create a condition to favor this international role and to create, to give euro a much you know, greater international presence in terms of uh, financial and monetary relation. To conclude, you know, let me add that in order to develop this kind of international presence and this kind of uh, 
uh, uh, contribution to rebuilding global economic governance is very important you know to strengthen social policy for worker and citizen at domestic level there is much that government can do as Carlotta is saying but they have not made you know in the past much progress and we do now and and and, and finally it's very clear that in order to have this much more autonomous and assertive uh, role we you know uh, uh, as the eu uh, uh, should create a much greater unity among member um, among member states in this regard you know it's very important to develop effective common decision uh, making mechanism and, and common capability in order to promote this uh, global uh, 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 international agenda so that is the priority that we indicate in the book looking at the future in order to you know build up this kind of new multilateralism that is vital as i said for the uh, european interest thank you uh, many, many thanks, Paolo. I think this is a, a brilliant synthesis of uh, all the debates we went through in our expert group. Uh, other authors work with us exactly on these issues of the external action. So um, you need to, uh, all uh, the audience need to, to read the book, then they, they will see the, the richness of our uh, debate. But then uh, we are confronted with the question is, what about the means? to conduct all this transformation. The transformation Carlotta Perez referred to, which should also be reflected on our way to uh, act in the world. Um, Europe uh, has been through difficult crisis recently. And I'm so pleased to count on Vivian Schmidt, uh, a very renowned author exactly on uh, these uh, developments of uh, European economic governance. We know that Europe is a sweet generis. Uh, European Union is a sweet generis uh, creation. Uh, but Vivian, what can you tell you uh, about the flaws and the way to go for the next phase regarding European economic uh, governance? Um, you are a Jean Monnet professor of European integration. Uh, you are coming from uh, Boston University. Our pleasure to give you the floor. So thank you, Maria, as well, and i um, delighted to be here. Um, in the decade preceding the pandemic, e the EU's economic governance suffered from a range of problems. The Eurozone crisis governance involved governing by rules and ruling by numbers with the wrong, num with the wrong rules and numbers, which didn't work, resulting in too little investment and low growth, plus continued macroeconomic divergence amongst countries. Globalization also went too far, leaving the EU vulnerable to breakdowns in global supply chains when it needed them the most. <clears throat> uh, to digital platforms that control and content and avoid taxes and general deindustrialization in Europe. On top of that, together, globalization and Europeanization have led to increasing discontent with the socioeconomic sources, such as workers feeling left behind with stagnant wages, bad jobs with bad benefits, increasing poverty, rising inequalities, gendered and others, and diminishing opportunities, especially think of high youth unemployment. There are also socio-cultural concerns linked to the socioeconomic involving loss of social status, and of course, political pushback, as Carlotta already mentioned, the politics of take back control, the decline of mainstream parties, the rise of Eurosceptic anti-system parties and movements. Blame these problems on what you will, the structures of capitalism, the driving forces of the markets, the political divisions among EU actors, the institutions and laws that make positive sum decision making so difficult. But don't forget the ideas, ordo liberal ideas about macroeconomic stability, focused on the dangers of deficits and debt and the benefits of austerity, which ignored needs for investment and growth. But not only neoliberal ideas, not only ordo liberal ideas, neoliberal ideas about the need for ever freer markets and less and less state, the glories of competitiveness and labor market flexibility, ignoring increasing social precariousness and insecurity. Importantly, however, since the pandemic, things have changed. There's increasing recognition of the need for new ideas about how to deal with the European economy under challenge, 
not just from health and economic disaster, but also from climate change. There's also recognition of the need to rethink European economic, the re European economic governance framework beyond the old ideas for an enhanced role for the state as an entrepreneur, as Carlotta mentioned, to promote growth and provide investments to meet the challenges of the green transition and the digital transformation, while repairing the damages wrought by both Euro crisis management and unmanaged globalization in order to move toward greater social equity with more democracy. So how do we get there from here? So we need to consider how to change policies and procedures while enhancing democracy. And for this, I suggest some pathways forward in a range of areas, but all very briefly. So in monetary policy and macroeconomic coordination, there are actually many new ideas about what the ECB could do. For example, to move from a focus on primary objectives to secondary objectives, make full employment, on a, full employment a target on a par with fighting inflation, no neutral bond buying, green bonds for the environment, helicopter money even for direct support to households, but beyond that, we need to create an EU safe asset while solving the national debt overhang for perhaps by having the European stability mechanism buying ECB sovereign bonds. But the question would be, how do we democratize and ensure accountability while doing this? One way would be to increase ECB accountability to the European Parliament with increased enhanced ECB European Parliament dialogues. Another would be to create new venues for democratic debate and de deliberation on EU macroeconomic governance. For example, why not create the Great Macroeconomic Dialogue as a yearly conference to give the ECB direction for its secondary objectives? Okay, but that's the ECB, that's macroeconomics. What about industrial policy in the European semester? I think, first of all, we have this temporary pandemic investment bonds, but one needs to think about permanent EU level debt. Uh, think of it as sovereign wealth funds to invest as grants to all member states in education, training, income support, as well as investment in greening the economy and digitally connecting people. And when we think about the next generation EU and the European semester, we need to rethink its purpose and its rules. One needs to permanently suspend or at least reform Eurozone debt and deficit rules. For example, abandon the fiscal rules, at least for fiscal standards or guidelines, if not abandon them at all. Have the, use the golden rule for public investment in growth enhancing areas. Ignore the size of debt, public debt entirely, so long as, gov as governments can borrow at a rate lower than the average rate of growth of the e GDP, it should not be a problem. And certainly, and this is about investment, for the future, eliminate the debt break from national constitutional legislation. Beyond this, rethink European semester procedures. Instead of a macroeconomic imbalance procedure, what about another macroeconomic dialogue and allow different targets for member states since they are all very different with different varieties of capitalism. Beyond that, decentralize and democratize the European semester. We're actually already halfway there with the new way in which the European semester has been deployed uh, through next generation EU. But we need to change the nature of the evaluations from fiscal boards, turn them into industrial policy advisors. Competitiveness councils should be industrial policy councils. And these need to be democratized with the social partners and civil society actors involved. And of course, why not more European Parliament involvement in the European semester? After all, now that it is, uh, now that it has a redistributive function, there's a real need for the European Parliament involvement. Then beyond this international trade and competition policy, there needs to be managed globalization. Global value chains should continue while recreating European and national supply chains. Uh, there should be inshoring of a portion of manufacturing capability and also raising the playing field, the, the level playing field, i.e. in terms of state aid, so that member states can invest and incentivize investment more. And this we're talking again about the role of the state. Think global, promoting European cha champions, and local, protecting infant industries where they're not a danger to the single market. State aid needs to have its re revise its rules to allow more state aid in order to grow to promote growth and greening and digitalizing the economy. 
And of course, taxation, but I'm not even going to get into that. There needs massive reform in terms of harmonizing corporate taxation, abolishing tax havens in the EU, um, and taxing corporations at the same rate. And finally, social and labor policy, one needs to move from labor market flexibility to labor market security. Part-time temp temporary gig workers should have the same social rights and protections as full-time workers. One needs to facilitate unionization. Uh, there needs to be common European unemployment reinsurance scheme and perhaps setting minimum wages or some equivalent arrangement and creating universal benefits. Think about a guaranteed basic minimum annual income with you know, perhaps via the digital dividend, get digital platforms to pay for our data and use this as tax revenue for a minimum income. And there's so many other ideas out there that one should use. In some, lots of ideas, but now's the time to implement them, to be sure and more manage globalization with a more proactive and democratized state at the EU level, able to respond to citizens' needs and demands to ensure their social rights, enhance their political participation, and of course, to counter the siren calls of populism. Thank you. <laughs> Vivian, uh, many, many thanks. This is such a rich uh, range of uh, initiatives and measures you are suggesting. And we do need to go much deeper in this discussion and we'll go uh, in our expert group for sure and in the Conference on the Future of Europe. This is at the heart of the kind of decision we need to take uh, beyond uh, the historical step we took uh, recently when launching a recovery plan financed by, for the first time, uh, European uh, debt uh, issuers. Um, I will give the floor to our last uh, speaker in the panel. Uh, I will invite all of you uh, to come up uh, with a, a very short message uh, about what is your special call to Europe, taking into account everything you said so far, which was so rich, but then I will ask you to come back with a 30 seconds sentence, what do you think should be the main initiative, particularly if we focus on a democratic state and a multi-level state, which we, we have in Europe. So I'll come back to you, but now let's uh, listen to our last speaker in the panel, Olivier Costa. Uh, you are a leading scientist exactly about the future of European democracy, the way to uh, transform the European political system. You are coming from College of uh, Europe, and I'm so pleased to count on you as one of the main authors of the book. Olivier, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Maria Jawa. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate participate in all the events that were uh, organized to prepare for that uh, for that book and have all those uh, very insightful uh, exchanges. So I was asked in that book uh, to think about the key changes to be uh, introduced to the European political system on the long term. Uh, so not an easy topic to address in a couple of pages. Um, I will just uh, uh, start with uh, four points uh, that are that I need to underline to prepare for such a reflection. The first time is that if we want to prepare for long-term uh, changes, that what, uh, what was asked, we need to start right now. Uh, we need to remember that uh, it took 20 years to adapt uh, the institution of uh, the European community uh, to the enlargement because uh, it took us uh, between 1990 and basically the Treaty of Lisbon to have some decent adaptation to the to the institutions. For, for the next step, if we really want to have a system which is more democratic and more open, we need to start right now because it will be a very long and difficult process. The second point is to say that we need to rely on long time trends. There are long time trends in the EU political system and we need to use them. We need to go with the wind, otherwise we will fail to change anything. The third remark is to say that we should have no taboo uh, regarding uh, the institution and have a very pragmatic approach. We need to consider the EU political system as it already currently works and not uh, as it is supposed to work. And for instance, we should not believe people 
who tell us that the commission is supposed to be an agency or an independent uh, body, whatever, uh, it is looking very much like a government and we need to take that for, for granted. And my, my final point um, is to say that we urgently need for clarification. Uh, uh, a political system, any political system cannot be democratic and perceived as legitimate if citizens don't understand how it works. And, and today, I think uh, the situation is not satisfying at all. We need a clearer system and we need a simple narrative for pe people to be able to understand what is going on uh, at, the EU, at the EU level. So what do we have? We have a system which is becoming more and more parliamentarized. This is what we can make as a global assessment of what happened in the last 30 years. If we look at the policy making, if we look at the logic of appointment of leaders, if we look at the logic of checks and balances and control, if we look at the logic of expression and agenda setting, what is very central here is the role of European elections, the, Euro the role of the European Parliament, and we need to build on that uh, to um, provide more uh, democratization. Uh, at the same time, we need to be uh, cautious in our proposal. The point is not to just replicate, for instance, uh, the German institution at EU level. This will not work. We need to assume the fundamentally hybrid nature of the EU and the virtues of the existing mm -hmm. system. We just need some sort of, of clarification. And uh, this will not be an easy task because people were brainstorming about bringing more democracy, more participation to the EU are not the only one brainstorming about the EU political system. And they are facing advocates of the intergovernmental approach who consider that everything should be in the hand of the European Council, which has been happening pretty much in the last 10 years. And some people are very satisfied with that approach of European integration. People like, let's say, Macron is really happy with the European Council being the main place of deliberation uh, at EU level. We also face proponents of what we could call the community method. People who say that the system is fine as it is and we should uh, just keep the status quo. So if we try to overcome those resistance coming from the intergovernmentalists and coming from people who consider that everything is fine as it is, I guess that there are six points on which we could think and there is nothing original here. The first one is that Spitzenkandidat and story, the lead candidate uh, uh, system. I think it has some virtues, but we cannot continue to work with the existing situation, with nothing written, and with a system which is implemented or not, depending on the political configuration or whatever. This is not democratic. We need some clarity for our citizens. This should go along with the transnational list, not an easy reform. It has been discussed in the EP for more than 20 years. I think it would be a nice reform from a symbolic standpoint, fitting very well with the Spitzenkandidaten. If we do the Spitzenkandidaten and the transnational list, then we need the European political parties to work in a democratic way. We need primaries at the level of EU political parties because it is not acceptable to have the future president of the commission just chosen by a couple of leaders uh, in a closed room. Fourth, we need to, the European Parliament to be granted with the right of legislative initiative. I I don't consider that as very important, functionally speaking, but symbolically speaking, it's very important. And citizens don't understand why the European Parliament is deprived from, from a such a right and why the Commission is still having a monopoly on that side. Fifth, we need to oblige the Council to behave as a high chamber. The treaty is already saying that more or less, but the Council is really refusing to play the political game is really refusing to assume politics and to assume transparency and here a change is needed. And the last point relates to the relation between the European Parliament and the European Council. We need to find a way to create a political dialogue between those two institutions. The European Parliament is really working hard on developing tools to have some sort of control or dialogue with the European Council, but the situation is currently not satisfying and we need more involvement of elected people on that, um, on that respect. Just to conclude, 
uh, we need preferably for all those reforms a global approach and i really believe uh, uh, here in the conference on the future of europe to be the place to propose reforms that make sense a global reform of the institution and the second point and this is very important in my view we need to link institutional um, changes with further developments of EU competences, for instance, in social policy or macroeconomic coordination, whatever. If we organize a reform of institution uh, which is totally remote, it will fail. And as it failed with the constitutional treaty, we need to explain to citizens that an institutional reform is needed because the EU is gaining more competences and thus there is a greater need for legitimation and democracy, which is what happened with the Single European Act or the Treaty, the treaty of Maastricht. So there is really a need to connect political reforms and institutional reforms. Thank you. Uh, Olivier, it was just great uh, because you could identify the key uh, changes we should prioritize when transforming the European political system and going beyond of the community method status quo and also the permanent bias towards an intergovernmental approach. Uh, so we have uh, a kind of a first summary of the regions of our book uh, because, in fact, we involve 36 authors, so it's a brilliant um, uh, outcome of a, a debate which was uh, extremely rich. And uh, today, with this round table, we just have the tip of the iceberg. So this is a kind of appetizer for the readers to go to the book. But now I'm extremely pleased uh, just to ask you, in 30 seconds, what is uh, your call to Europe as renowned European intellectuals? The voice. What can you tell you? Yes, yeah, yeah. uh, Very briefly, and then I give the floor to our uh, young authors. Let's start with Carlotta. I really think that the most important thing to do in the whole world is to change the tax system. Right now, the financial world is completely decoupled from the real economy. And uh, the way we are now treating finance is, is just favoring it as if more money flowing the way finance wants and it'll be better. We have to change that to make long-term finance pay little taxes, short-term finance pay very high taxes, <laughs> We need a financial transactions tax. We need to tax the bad. All the uh, green things have to be favored and the, and the non-green things and so on. It's a huge change, but it's got to be at least European level. And then, of course, try to serve as an example for, for other countries. But we've got to re-embed the tax system. It's just not working for the yes. real economy. Carlotta, I think you are completely right. And again, you are a brilliant uh, strategic uh, mind, mind. This uh, shows this very well. Uh, Paolo, what is your choice? I mean, I think the, the, the you know, greatest contribution of, of, of Europe for the future is, is trying to rebuild this new kind of interdependence across country. You know, we, we, we had a globalization with no rules, no institution. We are now, you know, we could enter into this kind of new uh, 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 interdependent you know, economy with, with openness and integration. I think Europe could give the, you know, highest and the previous contribution to this new multilateral kind of system. A smart, you know, uh, interdependence and globalization is possible. Europe, you know, is showing in its domestic area that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, working in this direction. I think this is, you know, in the in international, at the international level, the greatest contribution of the uh, uh, European Union. And I think, you know, there are very good uh, signs that we are moving in this direction and that there is a greater unity and consciousness and awareness of member countries 
that we should you know contribute and it is very clear that not the us not china could uh, you know in some way uh, do this by 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 themselves so the contribution of europe could be indeed unique and indeed very precious thank you very much paolo and what about you vivian so very, <clears throat> very briefly um i'm going to summarize what i said earlier because i think what we need to do is decentralize and democratize economic governance in europe in order to have more effective governance and greater legitimacy so for me the european semester as next generation eu should become more bottom up with the social partners and civil society at local regional and national levels involved with national governments executives and legislators legislatures in determining what works for them with their very different growth models and varieties of capitalism so important to recognize the great varieties and have everyone involved at all levels and then at the eu level one needs to see greater um or more what i would call the great macroeconomic dialogue um to coordinate not all not only the overall direction of eu industrial policy but also to provide direction to the ecb so this is all about bringing the people in thank you very much and uh, olivier yeah, um, my point will be more maybe about the method to foster all those reforms. And here I want to say a word about the Conference on the Future of Europe. I think it's really a key challenge to make that conference work. Uh, because we know that some actors are quite cynical toward that conference and don't want that conference to become to be a success. But we really need to use that conference as a tool to, to foster uh, that change because it's a unique occasion uh, to really have major changes regarding policies or regarding uh, regarding uh, institution and also because if the conference happens to be just a void exercise it will be very difficult in the future to ask citizens to uh, pay interest again to, uh, to to the eu they, they will in a way feel betrayed and here i think that european political parties have a major responsibility because they have the tools to intervene at the various level of the conference and to push for some ideas very clear message um in the meantime as you can see we have already leading feeders of our uh, political family with us Sergei Stadyshev, the president of the, our party of European Socialists, and Dilatje Garcia Perez, the, the president and the leader of our SND group in the European Parliament, and also member of the executive board of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So well, welcome to all of you. Let's now go to our young voices. I'm so proud that we could have all over our joint work to prepare this book brilliant young minds of Europeans, a new generation of Europeans, I must say, who are fully Europeans. Uh, they are uh, really a promising generation. And uh, I'm coming with two of, the, of them. Uh, Lucas Ultschreit, uh, born in Germany, but a full European, working now with the DGB, but uh, also uh, coming uh, from uh, Sciences Po in Paris. Uh, Lucas, what is your call to Europe? Thank you, Maria Jao, for having me, and thanks to all the previous speakers for their inspiring inputs. It's a pleasure to be here. So, my call to Europe will all be about setting the course for all future Europeans, because that's what we get to do in the following decade of the 2020s. Setting the course, um, that means, first of all, understanding that Europe stands at a historical crossroads then we have to develop a positive vision for this future to come. And finally, we have to move from a vision to concrete actions before it's too late. So to me, the first step is really understanding what we're talking about here when it comes to the future of Europe. Looking ahead to will determine the destiny of future generations, two main transformations come to mind, the climate crisis and the digital revolution of life and work. And what the two have in common is that they will mark my lifetime and yours either way, by design or by disaster. Digital technologies and the opportunities and risks that come with them are here to stay. We can understand, use and regulate them intelligently and for the good of the many, or we can wait and see what happens. Climate change is already happening. We can do our utmost to prevent the worst and limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, or we can stand by and watch the earth become a hothouse. 
as social democrats, as progressives, we must see that these two big challenges of our time are social issues. Let me give you two examples. The interactions between climate change and social inequalities are empirically clear. Those are communicating vessels that mutually reinforce one another. The rise of the digital economy, on the other hand, exacerbates the flaws of the capitalist system and even brings back patterns of value extraction and exploitation of workers that we thought were overcome. Think of platform work. So that is really what the discussion is about from my perspective. The second step takes us to the future. If we want to shape the best possible world for us and future generations especially, how would that look like? As progressives, we know that our ambition is a good life for all. And when it comes to the green and digital transformation, this ambition translates into a climate neutral economy that respects the Earth's carrying capacity, that focuses on well-being rather than blindly chasing GDP growth. An economy that provides decent, purposeful and well-paid work for all, including in the digital world of work. An economy that promotes equality, solidarity and cohesion rather than individualization and fragmentation of the society. And finally, an economy that uses digital technology to emancipate workers and connect people rather than to exploit them. So those are big words, but what must be done concretely to achieve this vision? I believe we must first radically transform our industrial policy, and therefore we have to rethink what we mean when we say growth. If growth continues to mean GDP growth, investment flows will go where profits are made. But we need investments to go where sustainable welfare is produced. As we've learned throughout the pandemic and even before, social well-being is very often not linked to financial returns. Industrial policy must thus direct money where its impact is best for the many. That is green tech and innovation, sure, but that is also the circular economy, the care sector, hospitals, education, sustainable housing, just to name a few of them. And yes, some industrial sectors with decent work and strong unions will either completely change or disappear. But we must not give in to the illusion that unsustainable jobs must be preserved whatever it takes, because it might just take our future to continue heating with fossil fuels and driving diesel cars. And that leads me to the second point, which I believe is crucial. We must provide workers with security, both of income and employment, as Vivian said previously, to be able to grow stronger along the way instead of being left behind. So work and time reduction can help to share the available amount of purpose for work more equally. Minimum and maximum income corridors can make the income distribution more sustainable. Better and universal social services, including unemployment benefits and reskilling, can make workers capable and willing to thrive in a more dynamic, transformative economy. Third, and Carlotta has mentioned this, fiscal policy must evolve. Not so much to finance the great investments we need, because we have other levers for this, but to enhance social justice, to promote redistribution, and create strong incentives for economic actors to move towards a sustainable way of doing business. We, the young generation, are not afraid of kerosene and digital taxes or a much more progressive taxation of wealth and inheritance. We must shift the tax burden from labor to capital and from sustainable businesses to those who ruin our planet. And what goes without saying is that digital and platform firms must not be allowed to avoid taxes any longer, period. Fourth and finally, we must manage to do all or at least most of this at EU level. Neither the climate crisis nor the digital players know national borders. If our endeavors to make the 2020s a decade of change shall not end in a race to the bottom, common European solutions are the only way forward. So let's rethink the tools we have in the European Union. Are unanimous council decisions fit for purpose when it comes to delivering radical transformation? I highly doubt it. And therefore, my call to Europe is that as equip ourselves with what we need to shape the future in a progressive way, strengthening the role of the European Parliament, of social partners and civil society stakeholders, moving to qualified majority for more and more policy areas are necessary conditions to make these young aspirations a reality. In the end, and I conclude on a happy note, we should imagine what future Europeans would think of us boomers, zoomers, millennials in 40 or 50 years time. If we are lucky to witness their honest judgment, and I do hope I will, it would be extremely beautiful to hear them say, we're proud of you guys. You did a good job after all. Thank you. Lucas, many thanks and uh, for your brilliant uh, statement, uh, call to Europe and uh, the happy note you could uh, uh, use to conclude your a very, very interesting speech. Let's go now to Alvar Oleart, again, a brilliant uh, European uh, young academic, uh, educated in the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, and now working as a researcher in Maastricht University. Alvaro, uh, you need to be short, but I'm sure that you'll be brilliant. Tell us. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Maria Joao, and thanks a lot to all the great panelists of this uh, roundtable. So in short, my uh, call to Europe would be to um, match policy with politics. And my argument is that it is uh, unrealistic to think that progressive ideas might come um, uh, into policy without uh, transnationalizing and democratizing the European Union. So this goes very much in line with uh, with uh, everything that all the panelists have said uh, previously, but especially, of course, uh, Vivian Schmidt, uh, who, who has argued uh, for a long time that uh, um, the EU suffers from uh, policy without politics, meaning that uh, most of the discussions, uh, especially related to EU economic governance, are presented as technical, administrative, um, uh, in short, uh, uh, governing by the rules and ruling by the numbers. Um, so uh, what I think is that, that the COVID-19 has illustrated is that EU member states are inextricably linked to one another. What happens in one member state has a direct consequence on, on, on what uh, happens in uh, other uh, member states. And this requires us to facilitate uh, mechanisms to also make politics more transnational. Um, and uh, in, in, in that spirit, uh, I would like to in some ways criticize the, the next generation EU package, which some uh, commentators have uh, conceived it as a, as a federalist moment, a Hamiltonian moment for the EU. And while uh, in terms of uh, content, and there is European debt mutualization, which was a taboo back in the Eurozone crisis, uh, still the process that uh, led to this uh, recovery package was pretty much intergovernmental, led by the European Council. And I think that uh, that remains problematic because of all the actors that are left aside in these uh, discussions. Um, the European Parliament, national parliaments, trade unions, NGOs were not necessarily involved uh, in, in the process, which poses uh, normative questions about uh, democracy in the EU and um, how we can make EU economic governance more responsive to um, uh, European citizens. Now, the crucial element here is that uh, progressive politics is already traveling beyond national borders. So we are seeing the emergence of movements like Me Too, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, Fridays for Future. Uh, so there are politics is already uh, traveling beyond borders, yet the EU institutional setup still uh, prioritizes intergovernmental processes. So uh, there is a mismatch between the transnational flow of politics and the um, intergovernmental processes uh, on which major decisions are uh, taken. So in, in this spirit, basically, uh, I would subscribe to uh, Olivier's um, uh, proposals, uh, just perhaps adding that there is a need to intertwine further national with European politics. So I think one of the crucial actors that is often left aside uh, in these uh, discussions in national parliaments, which I think may merit uh, a bigger role in European politics insofar that might give incentives to national politicians that have a big role uh, in the national public spheres to uh, bring European issues to the national agendas and thereby contributing to uh, linking uh, national and uh, European politics. So in short, uh, what, what I basically argue is that we need to foster uh, the democratization of EU policymaking, transnational activism, and bridge the divide between EU national politics. And all that is a precondition for bringing uh, progressive ideas into European policies. So mm -hmm. that's it. Thank you very much. Alvaro, many, many thanks. Uh, this is your special call. And this is a good moment because uh, we are now, uh, after this round table, which was there just to open your appetite, launching the book with one click. So for all the audience following us today and many others will follow afterwards, you just need to make one click to get this uh, book uh, prepared by FAPS Actor Group. The title is um, our European future, and here we are launching the book. So you just push the message and you can have it. Uh, and uh, here we are. <laughs>